Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Good to see you, Pastor. Would you please open your Bibles up to Psalm 130 this morning? And when you found Psalm 130, I would like to ask if you are able and willing, would you please stand so that I can read this out loud for us? is the word of the Lord to us. Let's pay close attention. Psalm 130. A song, a song of ascent. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. With him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together one more time this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, as we take time to enter into your word this morning, I pray that you would help us do so cautiously with reverence towards it. This is your holy word, God, and I, I just ask that you would prevent us from entering into it casually. And your Holy Spirit, help us seek through the depths of this psalm. I pray that it would speak to our souls, that your spirit would open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to receive what you have here today. God, although our time today cannot nearly be long enough to reach the, the true depths of your truth found here, I pray that what each of us walks home with today is exactly what you know that we need. Please put distractions out of our mind, Lord, so that we can focus it on worshiping you through the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. For those of you who are new or unfamiliar with what's been going on here over the last few weeks, we have been going through some psalms in our time of Advent. Uh, psalms have been a way that we can see the reality of our lives in this world and our relationships with God uh, painted in these poems that are so beautiful. These psalms have been a way for us to look forward towards Christmas with the anticipation of the psalmists so long ago as they looked forward for their Messiah. And today we still look forward for our Messiah to return. And so we've been blessed going through them, uh, not in any particular order, but just as, as we have seen fit to study God's word. This week we come to Psalm 130, uh, a unique psalm in many ways. It answers an important question that each of us need answered. The question is, what do we do when we're at the bottom of the pit we dug for ourselves? What do we do when we're at the bottom of the pit we've dug for ourselves? This psalm holds the key to that, and it's a key we're probably going to need, not just once, but many times. So hopefully we can pay close attention to the details of this psalm. First off, we learn from the text right off that it calls itself even a song of ascents. Uh, 
Another way of putting it is this is a pilgrim psalm, if you think about it in that way. In ancient Israel, as they would, were coming to Jerusalem for the three main festivals each year to celebrate Jerusalem being at the top of a hill, as they were going up the hill to Jerusalem, there are certain psalms that they would repeat, that they would sing together as they went up the hill. And, and so maybe this morning as we look at this psalm, you can imagine yourselves at the bottom of the hill, looking up to God's city, to his holy temple where he is. And I know we do not live in Israel, but I think each of us can relate to this idea of looking up towards God in a as we slowly approach him. And I think that's the attitude that uh, will help us, I think, understand where the psalmist is coming from. Not only is this a pilgrim song, it's a what's considered to be a, a penitential psalm. It's a psalm of recognition of faults and of failures. It's a song of a lament, of woe with circumstances. And this psalm happens to be a favorite of many great Christians throughout the centuries. This was, for example, John Calvin's favorite psalm. It was the favorite psalm of uh, Augustine and John Bunyan. When someone asked Martin Luther what his favorite psalms were, he, he said the Pauline Psalms, and he gave a short list of the Psalms that taught all of the doctrines of salvation from the Old Testament, and this was on the list included. This Psalm if we give it a chance, I think hopefully it can reach that special place in your heart too. Starting in verse 1, we read this. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. This psalmist starts with a plea from a place of distress. And, and, and this psalmist has pointed out where he is. If you were to think of a 911 call, calling the police, one of the first questions they're going to ask you is, what's your location? This psalmist is calling out from his location in the depths. And some of you have been in the depths. Now, we need to be clear here. This isn't just the depths because of your circumstances. These are the depths that you have put yourself in. They're the lowest of all depths, in a sense. When the Psalms use the imagery of the depths, often the picture it creates is, imagine, if you will, what it would be like as you were sinking to the bottom of the sea. Imagine a weight, an anchor tied to your leg. Imagine being pulled down, and I don't care if you've never swim before, I don't care if you're Michael Phelps, there's nothing you can do as you watch the light from above get dimmer and dimmer, as you feel the pressure collapsing in on you. And every struggle is just in vain as you plummet down, down, down. <coughs> you're starting to get cold. You, 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 you're having a hard time holding that last bit of oxygen in your lungs. They're on fire. That is the picture of where this psalmist is. Some of you know exactly what that's like in your life. You've been there. You remember being there. Maybe you are there right now when no one else knows it. As often the case, this time of year when everyone else is all cheery and merry, there are those who are very lonely, who are very destroyed, who are in their own depths as far down as it goes. That might be you today. This picture of a watery grave or a dark abyss, it, it's probably familiar to us. It's the same imagery that we even see from the book of Jonah before he's swallowed up by the whale, but as he sinks down, down, down. 
And the psalmist does one thing here right that we, we have to acknowledge even now. The psalmist cries out to the Lord. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. So often I feel like when we are down in the depths, especially when we have put ourselves in the depths from our sin, our attitude towards God often becomes one of avoidance. We are ashamed of work before him. We hide from him. We are uncomfortable. We sinned. We screwed up. We ruined parts of our life, maybe even. And, and rather than turning to God, we have a tendency to turn from him. But the psalmist knows something we need to know, which is if you do not turn to God, there is no escaping the depths. If you don't turn to him, you will stay in the depths. And God did not design you to live in the depths. He made you for so much more than that. And it says, I cried you, O Lord, hear my voice. And this is one of the interesting things with this picture. You have a man drowning, a sinner drowning, if you will. And he can't even really open his mouth to cry out. Or the water will come in and crush him. And, and this is one of the things that I think was pointed out to me by Charles Spurgeon, who was a great preacher. But the truest cry out to the Lord isn't just what you do with your lips. It's where it comes from your heart. And sometimes God puts you in the depths so that you can cry out from your heart. Hallelujah. And while we feel like while you're in the depths, you must be at your furthest from God. Oftentimes, that's actually when you are closest to God. That's where you will find his mercy and his salvation is in the depths. In verse 2. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. There's an interesting comparison when you look at the word for Lord in verse 1. It's if In your Bible, you'll notice it's all caps, L-O-R-D, as the name of God, which is Yahweh. It shows a personal relationship, a covenantal relationship with God. And then in verse 2, the way that it's used here, if you notice, it's not all in caps. It's the word Adonai. And what the psalmist is trying to point out in the two is in the first verse you have his declaration of who God is based on his covenantal relationship. In the second verse, it's the same language you would have if you were a servant going to a master saying, my Lord. It's a, it's a plea from a servant to his master. Lord, hear my voice. Be attentive to me. It's desperation. And I want to point out something once again. The psalmist knows that there is no escape from the depths apart from God. The psalmist knows that there is only one who can save him. And the psalmist knows that he needs the kind of God who can hear him. This is an important thing to think about because our world cries out to gods who cannot hear. If you have looked around and studied the world around us since the beginning, there has been the natural tendency for humans to make and shape gods after their own images. It sure starts out back in the ancient cultures with stones and wood where they would shape the gods to fit what they want their god to look like. But even today, the world shapes gods to fit their own images. You hear people telling you about, well, God's, he, he, he's inside you. So you just have to look inside you 
And, and, and when you look inside you, you will be saved. You will find your answers. No, that's, that's just not true. That's, that's a God that is no God. It's, it's them worshiping themselves and whatever they find inside themselves, and they are lost. People will tell you, you know, God's all around. He's in everything. And, and, and yes, God is all around, but he is not in everything. That's called pantheism. That's not Christianity. God is not the rock next to you. The two are not the same. People will shape their own religions, especially these days, shape their own religions to match their own desires for what they want the religions to be. And here's what I will tell you. In inventing their own gods, they're making gods who do nothing, who cannot hear them, who cannot save them. This psalmist knows there is one God. One God who he can call on, who has the ability to hear him and respond. That's the God of the Bible. We need to know that God if we are to be saved. Because there is no salvation apart from that. In verse 3, we see what causes this distance, if you will, between the psalmist and God. Because that's what really verse 1 and 2 show you, is, is this, this feeling of a, a, a distant relationship. And in verse 3, it talks about why that is. It says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? This psalmist in this verse talks about the fact that they have looked at their iniquities. They have looked at their sins, and they realize they cannot stand before God. This is essential to understand, because this is the difference between Christianity, true Christianity, and every other religion in the world. Every other religion, in some shape, some form or another, is a works-based religion. It's based on what you do to be right with God. Based on the efforts you put in, it's based on your track record before God. Did you do more goods than bads? Did you avoid doing enough bad things to be called good? That's what every other religion is based on. Christianity stands apart here. And this is actually one of the key verses that was used in the, in the salvation of John Wesley. Some of you might be familiar with John Wesley. He was a famous revivalist for a period. But what you may not know about John Wesley is he was a missionary and a pastor many years before he was actually saved. He talks about the story of how even though he had been a missionary, even though he had been a pastor, one day he encountered an introduction to the book of Psalms written by Martin Luther, and it shook him. And, and then as he left, he, he was going to his room at Aldersgate, and he was passing by St. Paul's Cathedral, and from the cathedral, a song was being sung out by the choir, a song of this psalm, of this verse. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? It hit John Wesley like a hammer. He knew. He knew for a fact. It didn't matter that he had spent years already in what he believed was service to the Lord. It didn't matter what he thought he knew. He knew for a fact at that moment he had been living his life trying to earn his relationship with God. And he knew that before the Lord, he could not stand. This is a judgment seat of God. And it, it only makes sense when you see how holy God is. Because it is only in light of God's holiness that any of the rest of this makes sense. <coughs> the... The 
reality is we I think and this is not this is not I'm talking as a church but as a culture what we see in the world is a result of a view of God that is too small when you look around this culture people have a small God God in mind it's a God of their own invention as I've said it's a God that they've made up it's a God that that really doesn't have an authority over you he, he's a partner alongside you or in a buddy at most this world you need to understand when you have a small view of God you also will get a small view of sin because if you have a small God then sin is a small offense and then forgiveness itself is not a big deal any longer. Forgiveness is something that anyone can have at no cost whatsoever whenever they like. And so, you know, in our world that, that typically mocks sin, it mocks sin because it's got a small view of who it's sinned against. When we look at God, when we look at who he is, and when we see him clearly as he stands, a righteous, holy, just God, when we see him high and lifted up, when we are at the bottom of the hill looking up to him, we understand we fall so far short that we have nothing to stand on before him. We are hopelessly lost before him. If God would mark your iniquities, who could stand? I mean, if I took your sins from today and decided to flash them on the screen for everyone to see, just from today, the thoughts that you've had, the motivations you've done, you wouldn't be able to bear to stand in this room. And that's in front of a group of sinners just like you. But before a holy and righteous God, each one of us comes to the judgment seat of God, comes to that courtroom of God, and we have only one plea we can give. I'm guilty. I am guilty. I am hopelessly lost and guilty, and I cannot stand. That's in the whole. When you are in that place of your own sin, you have to get to that point where you realize there is no climbing your way out of the hole. When you're getting dragged to the bottom of the sea, there is nothing you can do. You can't pull yourself up by the bootstraps and get out of this. There's a, a, a mining truth, and... and I don't know how many of you are miners, but one thing, if you've ever tried mining iron ore, you know, you go into the, the mountain, into the mines, you, you take your pickaxe and you pick these giant rocks, and these rocks are a mixture of material with iron inside. But here's the thing. If you take a hammer and start hammering away at these rocks, you will never get the iron out. Iron is so fused into those rocks, you cannot hammer it apart to separate it. The only way to get the iron, the pure iron out, is to take that rock, heat it up in a furnace, and the pure metal of the iron will leak out of the rest of the rock. And that's how you abstract iron. And what I want to point out to you is you will never, with your own hammer, be able to chisel away at that sin that has put you in that hole in order to save yourself. Mm -hmm. You need God's furnace. Yes. You need his fire. Mm -hmm. He is the one who can save you, and only he can. And so, verse 4 is where we find our hope. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. And this is something that we need to understand forgiveness is not just something God does but it's tied to his very character and nature in 
Deuteronomy chapter 7. We get this description of God that I think helps put this into perspective for us. Sorry, I didn't have it bookmarked, so give me one moment. Starting in verse 9, it says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And he repays to the face of those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with the one who hates him, and he will repay him to his face. Therefore, be careful to do the commandments of the statutes and the rules that I command you today. So we have the, the reality. God is a God of wrath. He is a God who deals out justice. But he also has this covenantal faithfulness. And when we study God, we understand that he is a God who longs to forgive you. He is a God that will keep forgiving you. Why? Because of his covenantal faithfulness, his character. He is a God of character who desires to forgive you. Don't you understand? You can't out -sin God. You can't go so far into the weeds that you are beyond his forgiveness. That's not the God we serve. God longs to forgive you. He desires to forgive you. And yet sometimes in the midst of our sins, rather than reaching out to him for that forgiveness that we don't deserve, we hide from him in our shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't deserve that forgiveness. Don't fool yourself to think that you do. But he is a forgiving God who wants to give it to you. There's an interesting turn of phrase. That I don't know if you noticed this in the verse we just read. It says, but with you there is forgiveness. That you may be feared. That doesn't sound quite right to us. We think when we have reached God's forgiveness, the next phrase should be that you may be loved. You know, we were, we've gotten his forgiveness, therefore we will love him. That's not what the psalmist says here, though. He says, with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. Here's something we need to understand. We fear the Lord before we receive forgiveness in the sense that we fear his wrath. We fear the, the rightful wrath of God upon us. But once we are saved, once we cross over from death into life, we still fear him. It's a different kind of fear, though. We no longer fear that he is going to send us to hell. But we fear him because he is our father. He is a father whom we love. We fear disappointing him. We fear his rightful discipline upon us. And even more so, why do we fear him above all the other reasons that we fear him? Because once we receive forgiveness we actually begin to get to know him more. Amen. And, and don't you understand, forgiveness leads to seeing God clearer. Amen. And when you start to see more and more and more of who God is, how great he is, how mighty his, he is, you start to see how little you are, yes. how undeserving you are of the forgiveness. And there is a genuine fear that just comes from knowing him better. And that's a good fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 6 says this about fear.
By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. That fear of the Lord is not just something that pushes you to him, but after you receive forgiveness, it's also what keeps you walking in the ways that he has set before you. It's a good thing to fear God. That was Proverbs 16, 6. <coughs> John Owen was another man who, he was a brilliant theologian. He, he also had this psalm as his favorite psalm. And, and he ended up writing a book about this psalm, this eight verse psalm that was over 450 pages long he was a man who loved this psalm and here's something he had to say he says this is the frame of most people they know little of God and are little troubled by anything that relates to him God is not reverenced sin is but a trifle forgiveness is a matter of nothing and it is gained for nothing. And, and what he tries to put into perspective is the difference between those who live with no fear of God, who walk according to the gods they made up in their heads, who, who live their lives without an understanding of their great and desperate need. And he compares that to those who have been in the pit, who have been in the abyss, who understand that they have nothing that can save them, that their iniquities are so high that there's no chance they can stand before God, and yet they cry out to God. And when he forgives them, they still fear him all the more. And, and so when we receive forgiveness, we understand something important about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not some cheap thing. Forgiveness is something that cost God. It cost God the life of Jesus Christ, his beloved son. And something that cost God so much should never be regarded as cheap. We need to understand God wants to give us forgiveness, but that forgiveness did come at a cost. And when God forgives us, We need to understand that as we receive that forgiveness, it puts a call and demand on our life as well. We now live a life where we are seeking after him, fearing him. And you know what? It's not going to be a perfect life because we're going to find ourselves back in that pit. Of course, we will be saved. But even us who are saved will at times find ourselves sinning and falling back into the sin that we thought we were done with, that we thought we were over with. And even then, you have a choice to make. Am I going to keep living in this depth, in this darkness, pretending like I'm fine? Am I going to confess, I need you again, Lord? That's the lifestyle of a Christian, a true Christian. It's one, sadly, of walking after God, falling into pits that we dug for ourselves, and having to have him pull us out and rescue us over and over again and again but dependent on him. Because if it was at all dependent on us, we wouldn't stand a chance. It's the unmerited, loving grace of God that changes all things for us here. And Greg Jones, a commentator, put it this way. To be forgiven by God, to be initiated in the life of God's kingdom, is to be transferred from one narrative the narrative of death and, de and uh, the death dealing sin to the narrative of God's reconciliation in Christ. And in this latter narrative, we are forgiven of our sins so that we can learn to become holy through lifelong repentance and forgiveness.
verse 5. It says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. In his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. More than the watchman for the morning. That's 5 and 6. This is something we have to put into perspective here. This psalmist was crying out to God, calling for forgiveness from God based on God's character. And yet, as this psalmist lived, he still hadn't seen the fulfillment of what these verses were pointing to. Now, there's some debate about who wrote this specific psalm. Some commentators, they think it's a, a pre-exilic psalm, a psalm written before Israel was sent into the exile. And that could make sense, after all. It seems to be the case that Solomon in 2 Chronicles quotes this psalm. But at the same time, it's also possible that this psalm was quoting him, and maybe it is, in fact, post-exilic, as some people think, something that was written after they, Israel was in the exile. But either way, no matter what things they had gone through, no matter if they had seen the destroyed Jerusalem, this psalmist was looking forward to a promise he hadn't even seen fulfilled yet. He is waiting and calling out for God to send deliverance. The kind of deliverance that actually rescues you from that iniquity. The kind of deliverance... The kind of deliverance that can actually bring forgiveness. And, and what were they waiting for? They were waiting for Jesus. This was a psalm looking forward to the hope in how God would save his people through Jesus. It was the hope in the word of God. So let me ask you today, why do you have any security at all in your relationship with God? How do you know you're saved? How do you know that your forgiveness is actually belonging to you? How do you know that your debt has been canceled? How do you know any of this? It's because he said so. He promised it in his word. That's what the psalmist points at in verse 5. My hope is in his word. Now listen. A lot of people will call themselves Christians, but they can toss this out at any day, any time. And what I will tell you is for you and I, we should not believe anything if it is not coming from his word. Amen. Amen. This is what we stand on. This is what I teach from. This is what you ought to be hanging on. You ought to be checking me against this thing because right. I'm fallible. This isn't. <laughs> Go to his word. It's what all of your hopes rest on. And if his word is not true, you have nothing to hope for. If his word is not true, then we're no better off than anyone else in their own world religion trying to get themselves to feel good about the way they live. Our hope is in his word because he promised in his word that he is a God who will forgive us. <coughs> This psalmist was waiting for the promise that God would send forgiveness for sins. Amen. He says he's waiting for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Mm -hmm. This image of a watchman, imagine this ancient city wall, the watchman on top, and the watchman, they're up there keeping an eye out for attackers. They're, but really, what are they longing for each and every night? They're looking for those first rays of sunshine. To come through that darkness. Signaling the end of their watch. But it's, it's where what they were looking for every single night. And they put their hope in its coming. Because that's the beautiful thing about the sunrise. Is it shows up every day. And so their hope is in that certainty. And that's the image that, that the psalmist is using here. My hope is in God's word. And it's a certainty. Mm -hmm. that it will come true because of his character. I know that there will be a sunrise. It's dark right now. 
I am in an abyss right now, but I know that there is light. And I have a certainty that there is light. And I am longing for that light. I am waiting for that light. And think about that beautiful morning. The morning after Jesus was born when he was in this world. As Mary and Joseph looked down at their, their beautiful baby. The light had come into the world. Hope had come into the world. Think again even later on. That beautiful morning when everyone runs to the tomb and the angels say, he is risen. That's the hope. And we now are in that period where we have a certainty of a hope at his coming again. We don't lose track of that. Hallelujah. And then at this moment in the psalm, after expressing himself in the pit, after expressing who God is, the psalmist becomes a preacher. He looks out to Israel in verse 7. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Yeah. That word steadfast love in, in Hebrew, it's, it's hesed. It's covenantal faithfulness. It's this loyalty. It's this kind of love that's built on the firmness of the character of God and his faithfulness. You will fail every day and God never will. It, it, it's one of those incredible things. If you remember the story of Hosea where he, he takes this wife who's a prostitute and she keeps cheating on him and he keeps coming back to her because he loves her. And he is loyal to her even if she isn't loyal to him. And yet we have a God like that who is covenantally faithful and loyal and loving. And his love isn't going anywhere for you. He loves you today and if you screw up today, he will still love you. You can screw up <coughs> continually each day needing to be rescued and he still loves you. He has a steady love. And why does he love you? It's not because of anything you are. It's not because of how special you are. I'm so special. <laughs> God loves me because I'm just so special. Some Christians, that, that they act like, why does God love me? Well, because I must be something really neat. And they'll sing songs about how God couldn't live without them. <laughs> no, 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 no. God doesn't love you because of how special you are. God loves you because of who he is. His love for you is not based on you. It's based on his character. His desire to keep forgiving you isn't based on your deserving of being forgiven over and over again. It's based on him. All of this is based on him. And it says, with the Lord, there is steadfast love. There's hesed. It's one of the most beautiful words in all of the Hebrew Bible. And with him is plentiful redemption. This word redemption in the Hebrew, it, you can translate it in a few ways, but one of the ways that really strikes me is you can translate it as there is a payment of atonement. A plentiful payment of atonement. That's what it very literally translates to. And that's the, the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to show in this last verse it says he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities and this, this psalmist's hope God has enough forgiveness for all he can save anyone he can save as many as will come to him and here's the beautiful thing about that that atonement is it's a complete atonement If you've ever known someone who's had cancer, you know, oftentimes with cancer, one of the things is they have these checkups every few months. And there's always a question when we go to these checkups. Did they get it all? And you, have, you wait a few months and, you, you know, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. That's the beautiful thing about the death of Jesus Christ. 
He got it all. He died in atonement for all of your sin. All of your sin. As many as will come to him, as many as he draws, he, he has died for all of their sins. His payment is perfect. It's absolute. It's complete. Yeah, thank you. And that's our salvation. There's nothing, I think, so beautiful. This psalm starts as the miserable cry of a nobody from nowhere, as Walter Brueggemann put it. But it ends in this beautiful picture of the kind of redemption that's given to us because of the God who is above all things. And it's all based on his character. And that's why we don't have to worry. What I mean by that is, do you think God sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay that payment for your sins do you think he did that so that when you die the first thing that you will see is a frown on God's face towards you a disappointed look on his face is that what God sent Jesus for? We have confidence and assurance because of our hope in his word. When we die, if we're saved, when we see God, the first thing we will see is this smile, this beautiful smile. It'll be the light, as it was talking about in our life. Everything in this world will be darkness compared to that light that we see. It's in that picture of going up the hill to Jerusalem, but it's getting there to the city of God, being with him in his presence. It's being pulled out of the depths where you were drowning and brought into his light, and you are now in the day with him. And he loves you. And he loves you because he loves you because he loves you. Not because of you. Because of him. And he will keep loving you forever and ever. And ever and ever. Amen. That's the kind of God we serve. This God of love. This God of love. Who instead of punishing us like we deserve offers forgiveness yes. now today if you aren't if you don't know this God if you have not received this forgiveness today is a day to wrestle with him today is a day to admit that you are in that pit and need him Thank you, Jesus. today is the day of salvation for you, Thank you Jesus. don't miss out on this today is the day where you can sit down you. where you can surrender all you can count the costs you can receive the costly forgiveness and you can follow him into the light. For us who are saved, maybe today's the day to get back out of that pit we fell back into. Maybe today is the day that we do what the psalmist did and we go out and preach. Preach the good news of God's gospel to any and everyone who will hear it. Let's go in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word here. Your beautiful psalm here. I just pray that as this psalm has touched so many lives throughout history, it would touch our lives as well. I pray that we would now know what to do when we have fallen into the pit that we dug. I pray that we can all be confronted with our complete inadequacy and our great need on you, need and dependency on you. I pray all of us can experience your unconditional, your unmerited love 
that never leaves us. Your steadfast love. And that as we walk in your forgiveness, we would walk in fear and love of you. And we follow after Jesus Christ, our Savior, with all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please be uh, stand so I can read a benediction over you all before we head out today?